know how they think, to know what their terms of references are. So when Ahmadinejad gets up, or the Ayatollah Khomeini gets up, or when the, the Muslim Brotherhood gets up at universities like this one and espouses its worldview, we understand where they're coming from. And let me assure you, this is not a Jewish problem. They're using anti-Semitism to promote their agenda, to get support from the grassroots and to take over societies and to take over institutions, and they're doing it very well. They're using anti-Semitism not in a dissimilar way to what the Nazis, the Nazis were doing between the First and Second World War. They're galvanizing their support, speaking about the Jews, speaking about the Zionists, and speaking about the Israeli. While they take away the rights and privileges of women, of religious minorities, of gay people, when they destroy basic notions of citizenship, the notion that everybody, regardless of our religion, our gender, our race, are equal under one law, should not begin and end at the borders of this country. This is, there's international human rights, and as scholars and as students, we have to understand the mind of the enemy and why we are silent and why this type of disgusting, vulgar lie that demonizes Jews and, and, and I'd say steals the history of South African people and what they endured in South Africa. And I, and I say this as a person who was the head of the African National Congress Solidarity Committee of Canada and was very active in the United Kingdom. I worked with the leadership of the African National Congress in the 80s and 90s when they were demonized as communists and all sorts of things. I did it because as a young Jew, I couldn't believe that in the 1980s and 90s, when I was coming to age, that a, an ideology of racist, fascist, and Nazism still existed. So as a young middle class Jew, I was a part of the anti-apartheid movement because if you look at the South African Freedom Charter, the anti-apartheid movement had a freedom charter that was basically a social democratic blueprint. It guaranteed all citizens of South Africa equality under one law. So as a middle class Canadian Jewish kid, that made sense to me. Everybody should be equal under the law. There shouldn't be institutionalized discrimination. But when people who parade themselves as liberals and human rights activists support this type of lie and actually support Hamas and Hezbollah that speak openly about exterminating the Jewish people, Something is really sick in our institutions. We have to become fluent in this ideology and understand when Judith Butler, the eminent scholar at this university, says that Hezbollah and Hamas should be seen as the progressive left, uh, the global left, that this is a, such a, a mischaracter mischaracterization of, of reality, but she gets away with it because she's a Jewish scholar attacking Jewish people and, and people like and to see that and she's rewarded for it. She should be and she must be called out on it. So the Lion Pack and, and, and students who care about human rights, it's vital that you get this message out uh, to your colleagues on campus. And we know from history that anti-Semitism begins with Jews but never ends with Jews. We know from history that once this disease of hatred is unleashed upon the Jews, it affects others, it affects other minorities, other marginal groups. And therefore, this is not a Jewish issue, it's not a parochial issue, it's basically a human rights issue, an issue of justice. And when Ayatollah Khomeini, Matthias, I know is going to speak about this, but 18 hours before President Obama signed the interim agreement with the Iranian Revolutionary Regime, Ayatollah Khomeini went on a, on a, on a rant saying that Jews were rabid dogs that were going to go, or that were going to basically be destroyed. And this is the exact quote. And there was not a sign of opposition, a peep of protest from the American government and from the other five countries that signed the interim agreement. And this rant of Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the regime, is consistent with the ideology of Iran and other radical Islamist organizations who believe that Jews are the descendants of apes and pigs, are rabid dogs that bring corruption and, and decadence and destruction to society.
Could you imagine if a white African leader would show up in the United States of America in 2014 and say that Africans were the descendants of apes and pigs? They ought to be, and I think they would, and I hope they would, they'd be sent packing home. And yet, our governments, our policymakers, our intellectuals are engaging these type of social movements, these type of ideology, and make all sorts of agreements with them in international law. And because anti-Semitism doesn't begin and end with Jews, it will weaken the strategic place of the United States of America down the road. And I think we see what's happening in the Ukraine, perhaps one could argue as a result of the acquiescence to issues of human rights internationally by the United States and other Western nations, and this weakens the West, it weakens the United States, and it weakens our, our capacity to influence things in a, in a proper way in the Middle East, and now it's coming into Europe. So this is really uh, uh, an essential issue. Today, Matthias is going to speak about Iran. He is a, a leading scholar uh, that has been documenting the ideology of radical political Islam, of especially the Iranian Revolution. He's an expert in his doctorate at Hamburg University, dealing with issues of nuclear uh, proliferation and, and nuclear uh, weaponry, but also he's an expert on the ideology of radical Islam. So he's an expert on nuclear issues, and he's an expert on the ide ideology and the anti-Semitism of, uh, of radical Islam. Matthias is, is from Germany. He's a professor of political science. He's also um, He's connected to the Vidal Sassoon Institute as a research scholar at Hebrew University. He's a member of the German Council of Foreign Relations and of the German Historical Association, as well as the Association for the Study of the Middle East and Africa. He is a leading scholar, a friend of Isgab, and has spoken uh, with us several times over the years. And it's an honor to have him here with you on, on an issue that should be the burning issue. You know, the fact that we are small groups wherever we go on this issue is an indication of how the agenda, I would argue, of human rights and anti-Semitism has been hijacked. You know, this room should be packed with thousands of students, but it's not. But I think you're in for a, 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 a treat, and we have such a leading expert here with us today. And I, I hope uh, you ask uh, many good questions to the press, and you're welcome. And thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank ISGAP for bringing me over from Europe to this country, and I also would like to thank Professor Pedergreen and Jacobson that they took this chance to make an additional event here, and I also would like to thank the Students group here at LINEPAC for co-organizing this uh, event tonight. Um, well, I, you know, the topic of my talk here is Obama's new Iran policy and the temptation of appeasement. And I don't want to conceal the slight twinge of unease that I feel tonight. How can this German guy dare to lecture Americans about their own government? And this is a legitimate question. So my answer is that I don't want to lecture anyone, but I would like to share with you some reflections about Obama's Iran policy from an outside and non-partisan perspective. True, I do not offer the typical German position. I'm a proud member of the advisory board of the American organization United Against nuclear Iran, which was founded by Richard Holbrooke some years ago, and I'm a critic of Germany's policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, a topic I've written two books about and spoke about this morning at the Kids Gap Center in the city. I was impressed by a statement that Senator Mark Kirk from Illinois issued last November after a briefing given by Secretary of State John Kerry on Iran at the Senate's Banking Committee. Quote, I think today is a day in which I witnessed a feature of nuclear war in the Middle East, in the future someday, that will be part of our children's heritage, he told the media. And 
then this administration, like Neville Chamberlain, is yielding a large and bloody conflict in the Middle East involving Iranian nuclear weapons that will now be part of our children's future. This is quite an alarming forecast, isn't it? Too alarming? We will see. Senator Kirk's statement gives us at least some impression of what is at stake when we talk about Iran and Obama's policies. I will dwell on the temptation of appeasement in the second part of my talk and will close with a final remark on Israel. In my writings, I used to support the American position towards Iran, especially Bill Clinton's approach, but now this policy has changed. The, da the date that marks the high point of the old American Iran policy was December 23, 2006. On that day, the Bush administration obtained a unanimous resolution from the Security Council calling on the Mullahs to keys all uranium enrichment and plutonium projects without delay. At the same time, sanctions were placed in Iran in order to back up these demands. This resolution classified Iran's nuclear program as a threat to international peace. In the event that Tehran failed to comply, the resolution threatened additional pressure. The date marking the sealing of a new American Iran policy is November 24, 2013. On that day, the five permanent members of the Security Council in Germany approved in Geneva an interim agreement with Iran that nullified the above-mentioned United, uh, United Nations resolution. Iran agreed to suspend the 20% uranium enrichment. The 5 plus 1 agreed to suspend elements of the sanctions regime, and both sides agreed to reach, if possible, within six months a mutually agreed comprehensive solution that would ensure that Iran's nuclear program will be exclusively peaceful. The White House paved the way for this so-called Geneva Agreement by conducting secret negotiations with Iran. These negotiations started in March 2013 and gained momentum after the new Iranian President Hassan Rouhani took the stage in August last year. These bilateral discussions had already produced an agreed United States-Iranian text by the time the first Geneva talks opened on November 7. However, when the French saw this first draft, they were troubled. The stumbling block was a plutonium breeder at Arak, a heavy water reactor without any civilian purpose. The American-Iranian draft suggested that this reactor should not be activated during a six-month period in which its construction could nevertheless continue. French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius, however, wanted construction to be halted as well and called the American-Iranian draft a deal for dummies. And that is what it was. It was well known that the activation of the reactor was not in any case possible before the end of 2014, so that the apparent Iranian concession not to activate it during a six-month period, in fact, conceded nothing. Two weeks later, the 5 plus 1 and Iran adopted a revised version of the Geneva Agreement with a footnote that clarified that the Iraq reactor can continue to be prepared for activation but with restrictions. In January, Iran's new president, Hassan Rouhani, asked a big crowd, do you know what the Geneva Agreement is? And he gave the answer. The Geneva Agreement means the superpowers surrender to the great Iranian nation. Unfortunately, Rouhani was correct. Tehran had breached at least six United Nations resolutions and was nevertheless rewarded in Geneva. Why? Because this agreement permits the enrichment of uranium below 5% and the research and development of the most modern centrifuges, test runs included. It keeps Iran's nuclear infrastructure intact and ignores the most pressing demands from the International Atomic Energy Agency, namely that Iran signed the additional protocol of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, 
and allowed transparency with respect to Iran's previous nuclear weapons research. The agreement makes it possible for Iran to become a nuclear threshold state and provides legitimacy for its nuclear efforts of the last 30 years. How can we explain this result? A short look back might help to answer this question. For Washington has shifted its policies on Iran again and again. At the beginning, President Bill Clinton played an important role by denying the Iranians access to nuclear technology at all. This was the most reasonable position. My PhD thesis written nearly 30 years ago was about the non-proliferation treaty. This treaty, in my opinion, does not require its members to proliferate nuclear technology to a revolutionary Islamist regime. In 2006, President Bush threw the Clinton Doctrine overboard. His new red line accepted for the first time the existence of a civil nuclear facilities in Iran, but ruled out weapon-related technologies such as enrichment. This change was done not least as a consequence of European appeasement vis-à-vis Iran and stubbornness towards Washington, with Germany regrettably at the forefront. In 2009, Barack Obama changed President Bush's red line and supported a proposal that accepted uranium enrichment up to 5% if Iran shipped some of its enriched materials abroad. Tehran promptly began to enrich uranium up to 20%. In 2012, Obama switched his red line again to quote Leon Panetta, then Secretary of Defense, our red line is, uh, to Iran is do not develop a nuclear weapon. But what does Panetta's demand, do not develop a nuclear weapon, actually mean? The New York Times provided a clue, quote, Iran would have to become a country like Japan, which has the capability to become an atomic power virtually overnight, if need be, but has rejected taking the final steps to possessing nuclear weapons. Such a situation could be, quote, the most attainable outcome for the West in its negotiations with Iran, and it's a newspaper already in January 2012, with reference to several American and European officials. The paper quoted a senior European diplomat, quote, if you are asking whether we would be satisfied with Iran becoming Japan, then the answer is a qualified yes, but it would have to be verifiable. This qualified yes meant a decision, the consequences of which can hardly be overestimated. For the comparison with Japan is misleading. It ignores all the factors that make the Iranian nuclear program particularly dangerous. It is true that Japan could easily become a nuclear power with atomic weapons, while no one in Seoul or Manila or Taipei is particularly worried about the Japanese nuclear potential. The Sunnis of the Persian Gulf region are already more than a little nervous today about the Iranian nuclear threat, not to mention Israel. This analogy is also wrong with regards to technology. There is a widespread assumption that Iran has a scientific, technical and industrial capacity to eventually produce nuclear weapons, as James Clapper, the director of national intelligence in the United States, put it recently. With that, assumptions, with that assumption comes the implication that Iran's political will to build or not to build the weapon is the last thing the West might have any leverage over. I disagree with that assumption. True, Iran could arguably detonate a primitive Iranian device even today. Iranian bombs, however, have big disadvantages compared to plutonium bombs. They are five times heavier, that means much more difficult to load onto missiles and they cannot serve as a detonator for modern nuclear hydrogen bombs. The United States and the Soviet Union abandoned the uranium route as being too cumbersome and unreliable 
China abandoned the uranium truck after years of trying as well. Like every other nuclear power, Iran needs not a maximum, but a minimum payload for its ballistic missiles. Otherwise, they just won't fly. For that, they need a plutonium. The process of creating plutonium, however, is still beyond the capability of Iran. And that is the reason why progress on the Arab plutonium reactor is the true sand in the hourglass. There is another important feature to keep in mind. You can hardly destroy the Arab reactor if it is already in operation because of the environmental catastrophe that could follow. Thus, the window of opportunity for Israel to eliminate this facility is swiftly closing. When and only when Iraq is up and running can Iran claim to be a modern nuclear threshold state. The Iranians thus need time, let's say a year or two, to complete their plutonium program without interference by the IDF. In 2003, in the course of the first round of nuclear negotiations, Rouhani granted the West some minimal concessions in order to complete the Iranian uh, uranium fuel cycle. In 2013, Rouhani again made some concessions in order to complete the Iranian plutonium cycle. This is, in my opinion, the main reason why Iran is taking part in the negotiations in Geneva. The regime wants to make it politically impossible for Israel to react within the next 12 months or so. The Jewish state, however, is held in check as long as the so-called negotiations go on. In terms in which Rouhani and Khamenei praise, the terms in which Rouhani and Khamenei praise their Geneva success are thus no accident. Rouhani wrote in his letter to Khamenei, quote, the ground has been paved to take further big steps to defend the country's technical developments. Guess what kind of technical developments he meant? Khamenei answered, the nuclear negotiation team deserves to be thanked for its achievements, which lay the foundation for the next prudent measure, which is what well, we can imagine. Let me conclude my excursion into nuclear weapons technology. The Geneva Agreement is, to use Rouhani's words, a surrender to the great Iranian nation in two respects. It fosters and affirms the Iranian nuclear option, but it also serves as a kind of smoke screen behind which the next prudent measure, the development of plutonium extraction, can be prepared. So in my view, the Geneva Agreement is not only a surrender, but a preemptive surrender. We know, of course, that Washington is not in any mood of the idea of Iran as a nuclear threshold state, not for nothing, has Washington been the hub and enforcer of the global sanctions against Tehran. Obama's overriding concern, however, is to wish to avoid war. The consequence of this decision is to allow the Iranian regime to become a nuclear threshold power as long as it does not actually test the bomb. President Obama made this clear in his most recent interview with Jeffrey Goldberg. Quote, if we have any chance to make sure that Iran renders their breakout capacity so minimal that we can handle it, then we've got to pursue that path. End quote. But how can Washington handle it? How can it prevent the accomplished fact of a secretly assembled Iranian bomb. President Obama answered the question with reference to, quote, a pretty long lead time in which we will know that they are making that attempt. This confidence, however, is extremely risky. First, the people responsible in Tehran frankly admit that they used to feed IAEA inspectors false information. Second, the IAEA inspectors' access to military installations is blocked. Third, United States authorities were surprised not only by the emergence of Indian and Pakistani nuclear bombs, but also by the establishment of Iran's uranium enrichment facility at Natanz. Fourth, the installation to produce uh, weapon-grade uh, uranium or plutonium and to assemble nuclear warheads 
are so compact that they could be accommodated in any major auto service center. Israeli's Prime Minister Netanyahu attacked the pretty long lead time argument in 2012 in a speech to the United Nations General Assembly. Quote, do we want to risk the security of the world on the assumption that we would find in time a small workshop in a country half the size of Europe? Similar doubts were expressed by Robert Gates, the former Defense Secretary in President Obama's cabinet. If their policy is to go to the threshold but not assemble a nuclear weapon, how do you tell that they have not assembled? I don't actually know how you would verify that. So let us assume that Washington would learn of the Iranian breakout intention early enough. Even in this case, there is no guarantee that President Obama would be willing to take the tough decision to attack Iran. Considering the prevailing anti-war atmosphere in America, there is a certain temptation to overlook the breakout attempt by the regime and to be surprised by the established fact. By then it will be too late. So what could be done? The first imperative, in my opinion, is to make the presumed prolongation of the Geneva Interim Agreement politically impossible. The office of the Iranian supreme leader maintained that the six months interim period is meaningless and that a final nuclear deal might require even 20 years of bargaining time. This is exactly what Tehran would like to have and what the United States should prevent. Mr. Obama must persuade Iran that he is not desperate for a deal, that he can afford to see negotiations for fail. I secondly believe that any attempt to maintain peace requires an unequivocal no to an Iranian nuclear weapons capability. A deal that promises peace while letting Iran stay poised on the edge of becoming a nuclear weapons power would endanger the world. However, nothing will be achieved if policymakers and media continue to yield to the temptation of appeasement, which brings me to my second topic. Winston Churchill defined appeasement as follows, an appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile hoping it will eat him last. This policy of appeasement is thus based on two complementary components, wishful thinking and fear. The more irrational and violent an adversary is, the stronger is the inclination to appease it. Thus, in the logic of appeasement, fear and the willingness for dialogue do not contradict, but rather intensify each other. The main thing is a crocodile, a weird and dangerous creature that spreads fear because its behavior is not predictable like Adolf Hitler or Ali Khamenei. Ali Khamenei intimates, intimidates. He names Israel the sinister, unclean, rabid dog in the region and adds that Israelis should not be called humans. He identifies diplomacy as a form of warfare. Every step, he said, forward and reverse, is similar to a battlefield and must be decided upon the advance in order to achieve the goal. The commanders of the Revolutionary Guards make threats as well. We have identified centers in America for attack that will create a shock, they said. We will conduct such a blow in which America will be destroyed from within, stated one of them in February this year. But Western politicians and media are accustomed to totally ignoring such expressions of incitement and aggression. Or take the example of Iran's Foreign Minister Zarif. He is the superstar of Iran's charm offensive and able indeed to mesmerize his, his listeners as I personally witnessed in Berlin. Nobody seems to have noticed, however, that Zarif threatens to acquire nuclear weapons. Quote, the only way 
you can ensure that Iran's nuclear program remains peaceful is by allowing it to take place in an acceptable, peaceful international environment he insisted back in September 2013. And the Reef repeated this thread again and again. Most of the media, thrilled by the Reef's smile, by his sonorous bass, by his image as an Iranian Gorbachev, ignored that threat. Which brings me to the second feature of appeasement, ignorance and irrational hope. During the 30s, quote, the British government steadfastly closed their eyes and ears to the disquieting symptoms in Europe, wrote Churchill, who was one of the very few British politicians who had read Mein Kampf. Churchill drew attention to the Nazis' philosophy of bloodlust and the fact that internal conditions in Germany bore no resemblance to those of a civilized state. And he said, only very silly people, of whom there are extremely large numbers in every country, could ignore all this. He stated in his memoirs. He remained, as we know, alone with his realism and his warning of a major war. Today, people seem to want to repeat yesterday's ignorance. The American president is a case in point. It is my impression that he is a prisoner of his own delusions. As an American who has Muslims in his family and has lived in Muslim-majority countries, Obama obviously felt from the very beginning of his first term a special responsibility, if not mission, to seek reconciliation with the Muslim world and especially the mullahs in Tehran by Korean favor. March 2009, Obama addressed the Persian Novorus festival, quote, we know that you are a great civilization. April 2009, Obama addressed the parliament in Ankara, quote, Iran is a great civilization, we will convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith. June 2009, Obama addressed Al-Azhar University in Cairo, quote, I have made clear to Iran's leaders and people that we are willing to move forward without preconditions. Any nation, including Iran, should have the right to access peaceful nuclear power. August 2009, Obama delivered a Ramadan message. Quote, I want to reiterate my commitment to a new beginning between America and the Muslims around the world. This new beginning must be borne out in a sustained effort to listen to each other and to learn from each other. But here is something that Obama has always refused to do, to listen to the message of a Muslim leader such as Ayatollah Khamenei, to study and to learn what Islamists do in fact say. Instead, his statements reveal that he and his advisors are not familiar with Islamism at all. Thus he compared what he calls the resistance of Hamas with the fight of black people in America. And he blames the West for creating the tensions that so-called violent extremists later exploit. This understanding, however, is simply wrong. Iran's rulers do not hate America for what it does. They hate America for what it is. They want to overcome the world of arrogance in its entirety. What does this term, world of arrogance, mean? It does not refer to George W. Bush or the Iraq war. It refers to every liberal society and democracy which is arrogant enough to establish its own laws instead of submitting to divine Sharia law. And this is the center of Islamist ideology, to detest the free will of human beings and to accept only the Islamist version of divine law, including whipping and stoning. Let me quote Article 2 of Iran's constitution. Quote, the Islamic Republic is a system of government based on the faith in the one God that he established the law and that man should resign to his will. This constitution has never been a topic of debate in the West. Instead, 
Whenever a new Iranian leader sends send out seemingly pragmatic signals, the West tries to convince itself that this is a long-awaited savior who will lead the regime onto a non-revolutionary path. In President Reagan's time, the savior was Hashemi Razanjani. President Clinton viewed the then President Mohammed Khatami as a new harbinger of hope. His foreign minister, Madeleine Albright, was the first to express regret for the role the United States had played in Iran and was the first to praise Khatami's policies, quote, the democratic wins in Iran are so refreshing and many of the ideas espoused by its leaders so encouraging. But how did Iranian leaders respond to this flattery back in 2000? Albright's speech did not strengthen Khatami's allies. The very next month, the Unicari, under the control of Supreme Leader Khamenei, started arresting leading journalists and putting them in prison, writes Dor Gold in his book on how Iran defies the West. This episode demonstrates that our accepted code of dialogue does not apply to the rulers of Iran. Normally, we would expect one's partner in the negotiation to repay generosity in kind. The Iranian regime, however, considers kindness a proof of weakness. Ali Khamenei does not think in terms of me and you, but of me of you. His president, Hassan Rouhani, does not relate the Geneva Agreement to a win-win situation, but to the capitulation of America and the victory of Iran. The Geneva Agreement means the superpowers surrender to the great Iranian nation, he told the proud. There is no question that with this remark, Rouhani wanted to hum humiliate the United States. It was a public speech. He knew about the effect. How did the White House react? Washington tried to downplay the insult. This is what the White House spokesman Jay Carney had to say. It is not surprising to us, and nor should it be surprising to you, that the Iranians are describing the agreement in a certain way their uh, their, towards their domestic audience. So the White House did not object to Rouhani's remarks. Instead, it safeguarded the Iranian president against his own words. The administration was eager to humbly play down the humiliation so as to save the dialogue. And this response shows what appeasement is about, to answer the slap in your face with an even more friendly smile. But we cannot compare the appeasement of the 30s with the appeasement of today without highlighting the most important difference, which brings me to my last point, Israel. In the 30s, there was no chance for Czechoslovakia to defend itself or for its leaders, uh, for example, Edward Benesch, to complain about what Chamberlain and Daladier did. Israel, in contrast, is strong. Netanyahu speaks out. And that is precisely why Israel is so sharply attacked today. The more Iran succeeds in upgrading its image, the stronger the downgrading of Israel's image seems to be. This erroneous belief that Iran has changed its course and that there is nothing to worry about is exactly what large quantities of people like to hear. Do they care about Iran's lies or about the nature of the Iranian nuclear threat? No. They just want the issue to go away. That is why those who still want to confront the fictions with facts are booed. The baseless optimism of the people, the media and the politicians, has established a new axis of symmetry. We find in the center the alleged peaceniks such as Obama and Rouhani, and at both edges the party poopers, naggers, warmongers, in short, the pig-headed elements in Israel and Iran. <coughs> Though this image turns everything <coughs> upside down, it is highly effective as long as the psychology of appeasement controls minds. 
Senator Mark Kirk, whom I quoted at the beginning of my talk, discovered this mood even in the Senate's banking committee, where he asked Secretary John Kerry about assessments he had received from Israel with regard to the Geneva Agreement. Mr. Kerry, however, dismissed this source and repeatedly told senators to, quote, disbelieve everything that the Israelis had just told them. No check, no doubt, no partnership, just rejection. Shut up, Israel. Or look how this administration and the media have treated the 58 senators supporting the Nuclear Weapons Free Iran Act, a bill to strengthen the American negotiation position vis-à-vis -vis Iran by threatening further sanctions if Tehran violates the Geneva Agreement. First, the Obama administration fought a fierce battle to convince Senate members not to pass any new measures against Tehran. Obama repeatedly threatened to use his veto against this bill. Second, the senators were accused of secretly working to push the country towards war with Iran. Quote, if certain members of Congress want the United States to take military action, they should be upfront with the American public and say so, requested Bernadette Meehan, the National Security Council spokeswoman. What an unprecedented insult. Third, a campaign against this bill was launched by pro-Iran lobby groups and grassroots organizations such as the Jewish organization J Street, which appealed to the war weariness of the American population. The J Street stickers bear the slogan, quote, no Iranian bomb, no new war, no to Senate Bill 1881. J Street's mobilization against a simple sanction law with the slogan, no new war, does indeed recall the fearful mood of the 30s in Europe. It sends a signal that the United States has surrendered its ability to compel Iran. Instead, this country seems to be impaled by the Mullahs. Fourthly, the accusation of Jewish activism in Congress follows. United States officials claim that Barack Obama and John Kerry were, quote, disturbed over what is being perceived in their inner circle as Jewish activism in Congress, wrote the Jerusalem Times. This complaint, ridiculous as it is, was not sent to American Jewish leaders, but to the Israel government. Isn't that unbelievable? Skeptics of the Geneva Agreements were thus identified as part of Israel's fifth column in the United States. Fifthly, the entertainment sector stepped in. In his daily show, broadcast by Comedy Central, John Stewart castigated the 58 senators who advocate a new sanctions bill as senators from the great state of Israel, rather than representing American interests. Stewart used here the Walt Mersheimer Israel lobby myth that crosses the line into anti-Semitism. Let me finally quote another important voice on this. Unfortunately, a pressure group in the United States, which is a warmongering group and is against constructive talks, is pursuing the interests of a foreign country and mostly receives its orders from that foreign country. The interests of one foreign country and one group have been imposed on the members of the United States Congress and we can see that even the interests of the United States are not considered in such actions. This, however, was the voice of a powerful anti-Semite. This was a statement by Hassan Rouhani, the Iranian president. The transition between a typical anti-Semitic statement and America's new smearing of Israelis or fellow Americans who are not willing to appease and to falsify reality is smooth, terribly smooth. I witnessed a feature of nuclear war in the Middle East in the future someday that will be part of our children's heritage, claimed Senator Mark Kirk after a briefing on Iran given by Secretary George Kerry. Was he exaggerating? I hope so. American pragmatism has often been able to rectify mistakes in the past. I hope that a big debate on the principles 
will take place about Iran becoming a nuclear threat or state. Do we want it or do we want to prevent it? I hope the American Congress will be determined enough to decisively act after the termination of the six-month interim period in July this year. Right now, there are many in the world who put their last best hope in this Congress. I hope that the frightening rhetoric of the Iranian regime will no longer be ignored, but addressed and self-confidently repudiated. I hope the media will reveal the truth about Iran's totalitarian system and its ideology and will cover the appalling human rights situation instead of keeping nearly anything out of sight that might endanger the so-called dialogue. This would also show how crazy it is to mark Israel of all states as a scapegoat. I hope so, but I am not sure. A potential catastrophe is looming. Nobody knows if a nuclear-armed Iran will allow itself to be disarmed and provide of its power without using its nukes. Whereas Chamberlain's policy back in the 30s led to a conventional war, the current policy of the Obama administration is conjuring up the threat of a nuclear war. Thank you very much for your patience. Great as there are questions or comments. Uh, has the Israeli seizure of the uh, Iranian weapons uh, shipment to Gaza has that created any talk in the answer? Oh, should I repeat myself? Uh, uh, again, please. Um, has the Israeli seizure of the Iranian weapons shipment to Gaza has that created any talk in, in the international arena that you know any doubt over Iran's intentions? Well, I have not seen big comments. Um, um, the, the rule is that uh, the dialogue will continue and uh, I, I read an article two days ago in the New York Times um, and the, the character of this article was this is a great chance for uh, Netanyahu and uh, he got much luck that he could find this because now he has a good argument against uh, the talks but it is of course um, just a kind of cover and you know so this was the direction of this article. So uh, normally it should have been a big impact because it shows that the terror uh, will go on. It shows that at the same time when Zarif in Berlin, I happened to meet him in Berlin and I, I listened to his talk, he said, well, we are against terrorism at all and yeah, everything like this. At the same time, this uh, long-range uh, rockets were sent uh, to the Gaza Strip. So uh, it would be very good if the world would react in a kind of, uh, you know, animalistic manner, but I don't see that. Israel invited all journalists to come and look at the inventory. We will see what... Nobody, none of the foreign media showed up. Yeah. There's no interest. So this is... Um, this it's is an inconvenient fact. Yeah. Right. Convenient right. is what... Um, strengthens the belief that Iran changed. Inconvenient is what shows right. the truth. A couple of interrelated questions. How much difference is there in the effectiveness of an Iranian nuclear threat between Iran having but one bomb and Iran having a number of bombs? And how big is that number? Um, if Iran has several years where she is below some sort of counteraction threshold, how valuable is this time for her in terms of increasing her missile fleets and in terms of building up her, her defenses, anti-aircraft defenses and other defenses against the counterattack? Well, I would say, of course, one bomb can be a catastrophe. But, you know, the Iranian leaders see themselves as one of the leaders of the world. So they won't be satisfied with just one bomb. They, they really want to compete with the United States. It's about world rule. Um, you know, I, uh, today I, I read what, what, uh, what Hossein Ibn Salami, the commander of the Islamic Revolution Guards, said yesterday at a conference in Tehran with the title, The Islamic World's Role in the Geometry of the World Powers. 
Now this is exactly the topic. And he said, Islam has given us the, this wish, um, capacity and power to destroy the Zionist regime so that, so that our hands will remain on the trigger from 1,400 kilometers away for the day when such a confrontation takes place. And so, you know, um, the fingers will remain on the trigger. That means not only one bomb. And they don't are, you know, building only one record or missile. Who, who did you quote? I'm sorry. Huh? Who was this? Who did you quote? Um, this, this quote was um, um, by Fast News from yesterday. Fast News is an official Persian uh, uh, news uh, 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 service. And it was from yesterday, Tuesday, March 11th. And so this was an uh, event at Tehran yesterday. And I, I haven't seen the New York Times today. I don't know if uh, New York Times reported. But, um, you know, I, I'm just reading books about uh, appeasement during the 30s. It's so interesting how Chamberlain worked together with the Times of London at that time. And how, how, how really um, there was a kind of um, unity and, and, and how the media, with very few exceptions, really supported this appeasement campaign. And so I would, it would be very good to have a study to compare London Times during the 30s and the New York Times in our times today. Okay. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. It was very, very well argued. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the talk. And I, I'm especially interested in, in your sort of descriptions of the, of the psychology of appeasement and the way that this works out. So I think it's, it's key. And I'm wondering if you could help us understand, for example, the difference between the attitude to North Korea, in which we do <clears throat> this representation of that regime as, as a completely ma manic, crazy regime, and the you know even the New York Times represents him as a lunatic. When in point of fact, I mean, the, the Iranian regime is no less lunatic. It's no less insane, and yet that's that's that one's represented. Well, do you have an understanding of why we why we have this differential representation? Mm. You know, I would say Iran is a crocodile, while North Korea is um, a humblebee, which is dangerous in comparison. So um, I would say the, the, the fear is one main factor, but it's not conscious, it's unconscious. And Iranians, the, the Iranian propaganda is much more powerful and much more open, open that they want to change the world. You know, if you, if you read, there are two important texts. Um, the first is the program of the Islamic Revolution. This is written by Khomeini in the middle of the 17th. It's called the Islamic State. This is the program of the Persian Revolution. And we, you know, we know the program of the Russian Revolution. Um, Lenin, what to do uh, 1902. Yeah. We know the program of the Chinese Revolution, the Mao scriptures. We know the um, program of the German Revolution, Hitler's Mein Kampf, and so on and so forth. But no one takes care about the program of this Islamic Revolution. But it's necessary to read Khomeini's book. And secondly, it's necessary to read the Constitution of Iran. So this is very important to understand, to try to understand, uh, which is very, very far away from our way of thinking. You know, what Islamism means and what this kind of revolution produces. And you will see in every case it's an international revolution. It's intended to change the world. It's a totalitarian system like uh, Marxism and like na National Socialism. They really believe it would be a better world without Israel. You know, they really say they could liberate the, the human beings um, if they destroy Israel. So this is the danger in the whole business that they are believing uh, this kind of utopian uh, thinking, and so um, it's um, and you don't have this similar things with the North Korean leader, which is you know quite another issue, another chapter. Yes. Um, I don't know if you delve into like internal Iranian politics but I was wondering if you could talk about how Islamist is the Iranian population itself, like, you know, 
know, back during the revolution of the Shah, you had like the two day, you had the uh, women, you had the, uh, you had a little bit of Islamists, you had the clerics, and then, then you had the middle class bazaar that was able to really push out, that was really able to change the politics in Iran. So I'm wondering if you can address who the players are today and how Islamists are that can maybe touch on the green revolution. Yes, um, of course. Um, even even you mentioned the Iran Revolution of 1979, and even you know, um, if you look at the situation in the year 1978 or 1977, the mosque was not a big place. You know, people don't like to go to this place, and the mullahs were considered to be very lazy, not really working, and so on and so forth. So um, there was not a real religious feeling. And so this revolution was done by three, uh, was coming from three sources. The first source was the nationalists uh, in the heritage of Mos Mossadegh. The first source were the leftists, the Tuli party. And only the third group was the Islamists around uh, 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 Khomeini. And, but but he, he was able to take the lead. Then. And, and, and today, you know, there is no other country uh, within the Muslim world where religion is so much hatred within the popularity. I will give you an example. I, I have a friend. Where religion is hated or religion yes. is hated? No, religion, the Islamic yeah. creed, uh -huh. is hated because they, um, what they knew about this is what the ruling people are saying to them. And so um, it's, it's really quite a difference if you, for example, uh, compare it with Egypt. So it's quite a difference what the population uh, is, is saying and thinking. In Egypt it's very, very clear that also road masses are very, very anti-Semitic. And you don't have the same in Iran. Uh, Radio East World, for example, which is um, broadcasting in, in Farsi language, is very popular in Iran. And, and so we... Uh, the American, uh, you know, model is uh, well known and, and very popular as well. So you don't have the same in other parts of the Arabic world. So it's uh, very interesting. And what I wanted to say is, uh, I, 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 I have a friend in Germany, in, in, in Iranian, and his brother is still living in Iran, and he told this uh, following story. Uh, when you uh, take a taxi in Iran, it's normally from a lot of people, eight people or nine people sitting in one car, and uh, there was one uh, traveler, very, you know, high, you know, very uh, tall. tall. Tall, yes, thank you. And so his his head always pushed against the roof of the car by every hole in the street, and every time the street has a hole and he gusses his um, a boot, um, he cried out Nasrallah, then the next poet, Nasrallah, Nasrallah. And what was it? It was meant, this is the leader of Hezbollah. And all the money of our state is going to Hezbollah instead of repairing the road. So this is a very typical expression, you know, popular expression of uh, uh, insatisfaction with what the regime is doing. Yes. <coughs> I'm curious if you think that uh, President Obama is trying to work out a deal with the Iranians so that um, they get the bomb after his presidency. You know, once he, the presidential library is all financed, and then the Persians uh, can have their bomb and everyone's happy. Also, I'm wondering if uh, the Europeans and President Obama is saying, after they get the bomb, We'll let the Israelis take care of it if they want to, but we'll we'll never, uh, you know, we're not going to take care of it. It's a, if the Jews want to uh, get involved in, in a fight with a nuclear fight, we'll let it up. It'll it'll be up to the Jews to get it. Well, this comment is difficult to you know because I don't I really I really don't know exactly the motivation of Obama. And I, I, don't, I don't believe that he really wants Iran to get a bomb. Um, I don't think he's, uh, you know, uh, it sounds for me like a conspiracy theory. And so I think he's really believing, like Chamberlain, 
that he is doing a very worthful thing for humankind and humanity. And if you look at the psychology of Chamberlain and of the psychology of Obama, there are very interesting, uh, um, uh, very similar features. For example, a kind of Nazism, you know, and that, um, saying, I'm very, very uh, capable of um, changing the world in a better direction. And if you read his, see, uh, uh, his talk at uh, Oslo, when he got the uh, Peace Nobel Prize, uh, you, you find uh, similar um, aspects. And so I, I more believe that he is really uh, inside his, his own delusional world and really thinking some resolution can be found without, uh, you know, uh, using arms and without any kind of war. And of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of war. I would be happy we, we had a war without uh, the need of war, but sadly enough, sometimes uh, you need uh, the power of military to, to rescue things. So. Yes. Well, just along those lines, um, how do you think the, the you know events in in, um, in the Soviet Union right now, in terms of the, the Soviet Union, you know, putting boots on the ground? Um, <laughs> the Soviet Union is that it does not exist. Russia. Russia. The Soviet Union exists in the mind of Putin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my slip of the tongue was his slip of the tongue. Okay. Um, <laughs> actually, but I mean, there actually has been a certain some of the theses that you brought out about appeasement, I think, have come out um, more mainstream and now, interestingly, around these events. Um, in other words, more and more commentators have sort of said that this was a result or an indication of our appeasement position. Well, the problem is that um, also in the case of Egypt and in the case of Iran, when the uprising uh, took place in 2009, the Obama administration failed to put the Western values in the forefront. Um, but they tried to cooperate with Islamists. In Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood, and in Iran with the regime, with Khamenei. And so this was a big strategic mistake, I would say. It was a kind of answer, perhaps, to uh, George W. Bush's initiative to bring democracy to the Arabic world, uh, so it was a kind of counter strike, you know what I mean? And now saying we would not want to deal with any value uh, we share in the United States, they shall do what they want and it's not our business. And this was a mistake because in all those countries there are people who are in favor of liberal democracy. In all those countries there are people who are in favor of religious tolerance. But you know the cops in Egypt they had no partner in the West to, to deal with. And the moderates in Syria, they had no partner to deal with in the West. So the West showed its back to them instead of really engaging them in this kind of struggle. And so this is connected, of course, also with what happens in Kiev and uh, at the Krim. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, I'm listening here. Okay. Uh, I just want to know: is the is world peace more important? Ruling the world is more important than uh, world peace for Jews and, or Israel? Or I'm talking about Do you think? I, you know, I think it's not a question of religion. It's a question: is the human desire to have peace? Uh, I think this is obvious. And, and to have tolerance. And so there are so many Muslims in the world who hate Islamism because they are the first victims of Islam. Um, you know, getting forced to carry the veil, for example, or getting forced to um, forced marriage or something like that. So, so I think this is a universal uh, interest, uh, independent if you are a Jew, a Muslim, or Christ, or like myself, uh, um, essays, you know, it's um, uh, it's it's the same. I would say. Yes. 
do you think that in a, in a relatively reasonable period of time you will simply have a bad deal coming out of Geneva, or that Geneva will just be dragged on and on and on with no deal? I, this is my feeling. You know, um, pr the President Obama told the people publicly that he sees the chance of an agreement 50%. This is not very much. And <laughs> the Iranians said, well, this is even an exaggeration. The Iranians say it's less than 50%. But at the same time, Obama was very much against this bill, which could strengthen the negotiation position of the West in order to make sure that there will be a kind of solution after six months. So this alone indicates that everyone is thinking about at least one year and then perhaps even longer. And so during those months, uh, the Iranians are able to, uh, you know, concentrate on more uranium enrichment research uh, to build every component uh, for Iraq, for the plutonium reactor, only outside of the reactor they are allowed to build it and then they could put it in to a later point of time. So I, this is my, my um, well, forecast that mm -hmm. they want to break it on and break it on and break it on. And this is, of course, the situation where Israel is kept at bay. In the and uh, then had to accept, perhaps, uh, the threshold state Iraq. It's very dangerous. So, no more questions? Yes, one question. Uh, I read somewhere that China is supplying uh, Iran some of the technology that um, they need to accelerate you know, making the bomb. Well, not only China. Uh, also, European technology is going to that place. Uh, there is a big smuggling industry, and uh, even Germany is one of the main, uh, you know, supporters in a way. So it's not only China, but China and Russia, of course, they um, they don't. Uh, you know, the, you you mentioned Soviet Union and and and, and mix it up with Russia. And I have the feeling with Russia today that they have the same tactic as with the Hitler Stalin Party, you know? Um, if we can't deal with the West, well, we will deal with the Iranians. And we'll, we'll, we'll give them, uh, you know, a bit of money and we'll make exchange with, with them. So it's, it's really a, a, a weird world and the West is, you know, more and more in a minority position. Uh, if you see the power of China and the power of Russia today. And so it's even more important that the West is really playing out its values and, um, you know, really supporting uh, religious tolerance and the liberal democracy of the world. Okay. So, thank you very much for your Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Kunzel for coming.